Uh, my name is Al Briggs. I'll be your uh, host for, for today's session. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, to get started, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands I work and live with my family. I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders past and present. And I also acknowledge the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands, waters and cultures across Australia and the world, wherever participants of this workshop may be located today. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Al Briggs. As I said, uh, my background is I am a education consultant, graphic designer, senior learning designer. I've I've been working in vocational education and higher education for the last 20 years. Um, my background has been as a graphic designer moving across into an education space. So I've been teaching the Adobe software for all of that 20 years. Um, more recently, over the last few years, I've been spending a lot of time going in and teaching people how to use Adobe Express, both teachers and students, and trying to look at ways to get the most out of tools like Adobe Express in all sorts of different classroom settings. So today, that's what we're going to be going in and doing. We're going to be taking a look at Adobe in education. We'll have a very quick chat at the start about the why of it. We're going to take a look at why Express is a fantastic tool to add to your arsenal, to add strings to your bow, to, to add to your, your, your skill set. Um, and what I'd really like for the audience to do is put your student hat on as well as your educator hat on while you're going in and doing this workshop. So I'm going to step you through one aspect of Express. Express is an amazing program. There are so many different things you can do with it. I'm going to focus on one thing, which is the web page component, because with a web page, we can use that for all sorts of things, including presentations, reflective documentation, um, for digital folios, for research reports, all sorts of bits and pieces um, that are that are contextualizable and useful for students at any level of tertiary study. Um, we're going to get started in just a second, but what I've got for everybody to work with today is a resource and I'm going to put it into the chat and here is the link to it in the chat. And if you are watching this with your mobile phone sitting next to you, um, that is fantastic. I'm just going to put it in the chat. I put it in the wrong chat. There we go. So that's now in the chat. Um, I'm also going to go in and put a QR code up on the screen for you. So if you do have your mobile phone with you, or if you're watching this back and you want to check it out on your mobile phone, that's the QR code that will link to the workshop resources that we're going to be using today. Now, this is just something I tend to do at the start of a session every time I go in and run a session because I really like finding ways to get students to use tools that they've already got access to. One of the reasons that I love Adobe Express is the fact that it is browser-based and there's also an app version of it. So you don't need a $3,500 computer to be able to go in and run this stuff. All you need is an internet connection. What I've created and what we're sharing today is a resource that's been created in Adobe Express as a web page. You'll notice if you're going in and checking this out on your phone, it's going to be opening up in your browser and it's a link that you've got access to. There are, there are resources inside of there. There are examples, there are links out to you know, contact me to contact the Adobe team, all sorts of things. But using a QR code at the start of the session, I find really useful because what it does is it gets the my, my students or my participants to actually have that resource on their mobile device so that they can follow along on the computer and use the mobile as a learning and teaching tool. And it's just I, possibly I'm just going in and deluding myself that students are, are going in and using their phones for education and not for TikTok. Maybe I am deluding myself and maybe maybe they are going in and doing that. But I like to go in and try and engage students at their point of need. And, and what we've got is students coming through into higher education now who've had a very disruptive secondary education space where they've had COVID and they've had working from home or learning from home. They've had all those sorts of issues. They are what we call digitally 
fluent or digital natives. I don't tend to consider that these kids are necessarily digitally fluent or digitally literate. What I look at is, is the idea that they are familiar with technology, but not necessarily about how to go in and harness it for education purposes. QR code is a very, very simple, straightforward way to go in and start getting students to go in and use that. The other great thing about it is that it means that if you're going in and instructing students, rather than them having to jump in from their learning management system and then back into their work and jumping between screens or tabs or whatever it is, they can actually do it between devices. So they're using that mobile phone as a guide to work with uh, their, their desktop computer or laptop or, or smart book or, or whatever it happens to be. So that's 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 that doc. This is what it looks like, and this is what we're going to be going through today. So obviously the title of the session is Getting Started with Adobe in Learning and Teaching. So hopefully people are here because they they know a bit about Adobe and, and what it what, what it has to do and what it has to, to offer in an education space. But obviously the Adobe Creative Cloud is a collection of software applications and resources that can be used for any project that would benefit from a creative approach. I tend to think of it, anything that combines word and image together, there is a tool that Adobe can go in and use or, or that you can utilize that has been created by Adobe that will help with that process. So we've got a table here and you'll see that this table actually exists inside of um, the, the, the document. So you can feel free to go in and refer to this. What I've done here is I've broken up getting started and upskilling across each of these different sort of project outcome areas. So you may find that in whatever area you're teaching, that photography or design illustration aren't necessarily really important things. You may have no interest or no need to be going in and focusing on prototyping or user experience or user interface. But across all of higher education, there is a need to be going in and being competent and capable at, at presenting your work digitally to be able to go in and present information that is clear, that is to the point, and that supports your underlying reasoning. So whether it be going in and creating an infographic that is highlighting and showcasing, you know, summarizing information from, from a research report or something like that, whether it be looking at going in and doing some sort of reflective piece where you're going in and you're, you're, you're focusing on a process and then you're reflecting on that process after the fact. There are tools that can work there. We are not here today to try and go in and say everybody needs to be a Photoshop master. That's not that's not the aim of this. But the idea is that everybody can use these creative tools. There are no such things as creative stu students versus non-creative students. Everybody can include creativity into their work and Express is one of the fantastic ways to go in and do this. And you'll notice from that table, Express is in pretty much every single one of those, those, those entry level spaces. So Adobe Express is what we're looking at today primarily. One of the things that we, we, we talk about as being a really important component of all tertiary education is soft skills. And soft skills are those things that you're not necessarily including into your curriculum, but you're hoping that students will, will gain, not necessarily through osmosis, but through experience, through practice, through, through repetition and through confidence. So things like creativity, critical thinking, teamwork, they're all things that can be harnessed and can be um, highlighted by, by, by the use of some of these digital tools. So we're starting right at the start with Express. Today's session, we're going to go in and create a web page in Express. At the end of the session, we'll take a quick look at some of the new amazing things that are coming up in the beta version of Express, which has just been released in public beta, which means everybody's got access to it. And there are some amazing things in there that are going to be rolling out into the application itself over the coming months. Excuse me. So inside of this document, there is a link directly out to Adobe Express. And you can see here, there's a bit of information about some of the things you can use it for, which I've already touched on. The other thing that we haven't really sort of spoken about is social media. So if you've got any sort of social media aspects, if your program is a marketing based program or students need to go in and have some sort of link into to, to that business marketing side of, of, of the process, 
there are some brilliant tools for social media inside of Express where you can go in and create assets. You can go in and schedule your media posts so they can be sent out. You know, if you need your Facebook post to be posted every Friday at 6 p.m. and your Instagram every Thursday at 7 p.m., you can go in and organize all that sort of stuff ahead of time. You can create brands. So if you are from an, a, a university and you need to go in and universitize, not a word I know, but that's okay. If you need to go in and make your work look like it's from your university, you can very easily go in and brand that out. If you've got external clients, you can go in and do the same thing. Or if you've got personal preference for colors, for typefaces, those sorts of things, you can go in and create your own brand. The document that I've shared with you here is one that is based on my personal brand, um, which which includes that nice sort of soft blue and orange coloring. Um, there is an example of what we're going to be doing in today's session, and I'm going to very quickly go through there, but there are also links out to some resources. Um, inside of that staff introductory web page example, I'm just going to click on that link so you can see it. This is what we're going to be making. It's going to take around about 30, 35 minutes. I'm going to pace myself very slowly to try and make sure that anybody who is following along with me doesn't need to constantly pause and stop and rewind on the video. Don't feel ashamed if you need to. That's okay. This is a really simple process. I'm going to be as thorough as I possibly can. I'm going at quite a slow pace. If you've got some experience with this, feel free to jump ahead or jump back, take a look, give, give it a go yourself. Really, the most important thing is this first 30 minutes of dipping your toes into the Adobe Express waters. Once your feet are used to the Adobe Express space, everything else will flow. It is a really simple bit of software to go in and use, and people can create amazing things in it. This is all about that confidence building. And again, this is very much framed around the sort of workshops that I do at universities where I go in and introduce this to students right at the start of the student journey. So in orientation week or week one, getting students to go in and do this little sort of snapshot, which is basically a, who am I, why am I here? Not in a you know, metaphysical, why am I here on earth sort of sense, but why are you at the university? What are you wanting to get out of the course? So it works as a bit of an icebreaker, which we know students hate going in doing icebreaking activities but it also works as a way of going in and introducing students to submitting work through their learning management system. And it also gives them an opportunity to learn a new tool that they can then go in and use and refresh and, and, and work through as they're, as they're working as a student. So if they're going to create a digital portfolio of work across their studies, or they want to go in and create a CV, or like I said, if, if they need to go in and create a reflective journal or something like that, where they're going in and summarizing what they've done each week, an express web page is a brilliant way to go in and do that. We're going to take a look at some of the features in there. We're going to take a look at how you can create a split layout or a glide show. And this is a glide show, and this is the one that we're going to be focusing on. We're going to go in and look at how to add buttons in, and then we're going to go in and export it and share it, and I'll show you how easy it is to become a published web designer. That's a lot of talking. I've been talking for 13 minutes, and we haven't jumped into the software yet. So let's go in and do that now. I'm going to go in and open up Express, and this is what Express looks like. So you'll see when you open up Express, you'll see you've got a big pink and purple button in the top left hand corner. If you are inside the beta version and you can access the beta version through this little just little window at the top there, you'll see it's similar interface. It looks slightly different and we will touch on this just at the very end of the session. But essentially anywhere you see a circle with a plus in it in Adobe Express is a spot where you can go in and add content or create something new. Over on the left, we've got our navigation. So that's where we can go in and create brands. And there are some details on how to go in and do that inside of the reference that I've given you today. So please feel free to go in and jump in and do that as a sort of a follow-up step. You can go in and create libraries. You can do, like I said, social media sharing. As with every Adobe app, there is a light globe on the homepage that says learn. That's where you can find all sorts of resources online to go in and support your learning in that space. When I click on the plus here, you'll see I can create a whole bunch of different designs from templates, including posters, collages, social media, web page, which is what we're going to do. 
And then over here on the right, we've got a bunch of quick actions. And this is sort of like the Swiss Army knife component of Adobe Express, where it's not a substitute for Photoshop or for Premiere Pro or Rush or, or Acrobat but you can do some of those quick things in there. If you need to quickly resize an image or change the image format, for example, or if you need to merge a couple of videos together or convert a file to a PDF, you can do it really easily inside of Express. Remember it's browser-based, which means so long as you're logging in with your institution ID, you can access all of this work from anywhere in the world. You can edit, you can change, you can update, you can do all those sorts of things, which in terms of accessibility for students is an absolutely wonderful thing because it means that you're not having to go in and get your IT department to be going in and spending stacks of time going in and creating a disk image that has all of the right software on it in every single space. All they need is browser-based access. Um, to go in and show you how something like the Remove Background tool works, because we're going to go in and include a headshot inside of our um, inside of our, our web page today, there's the one I prepared earlier. Um, I'm going to go in and show you how easy it is to go in and remove a background from an image by clicking on Remove Background. Now I could either go in and drag and drop an image in there. I could even use my webcam on my computer to do it. I'm going to go in and click on Browse My Device. I'm going to grab a headshot that I've got that is hopefully sitting on my desktop. Here's one I prepared earlier. That was me wearing a very slightly different jumper. And you'll notice as I'm talking, this is going in and actually working its magic and getting rid of the background. Um, this used to be a process that as a graphic designer, I would teach students and complex masking is something that takes a significant amount of time. It can take an hour half an hour, depending on the image. If you've got hair like mine, which is rapidly receding and going gray and getting finer and finer, you'll you'll see there are some little sort of frizzy details at the top there. One of the reasons that photo retouchers really like bald people is it's very, very easy to go in and style around a, a flat object. Um, but you'll see it's done a pretty good job. It's gone in and while I've been talking, just removed that background. I can customize that further. I can download it. If I want to go in and customize it, it opens it up inside of my edit window in Express. And what you see inside of Express is that all of that interface that you may be used to when you've opened up Photoshop or Premiere Pro or something else before, it's all very much simplified. So you've got your tools over on the left, you've got your edit windows over on the right. You'll notice I can go in and resize myself here. So I'll make myself nice and big there. I can click on the background to go in and change the color. So I might go in and choose a, a, a branded color that I've got. So if I wanted to go in and choose something that, that is going to go with the rest of my branding, I could go in and choose that sort of a color. I could go in and remove the color altogether. Um, if I wanted to go in and change myself, change what I look like, I could go under my colors option here and under my effects, I could add a filter. I could make myself a duo tone. I'll make myself grayscale. Um, if I wanted to go and make myself grayscale so that I don't look so gray with that blue background, I could look at maybe hitting my blending mode and changing it to a multiply to get a nice sort of soft, subtle transition there. If I'm happy with that image, and I'm not necessarily happy because I don't think anybody really likes photos of themselves, but for me, that's going to do for now. This could be something that you could be going in and using on your staff profile page, or your students could be using it as a little headshot as a way of going in and introducing themselves to their fellow students. I click up the top here where I have my download options, and you can see I can download it as a portable network graphic or PNG. I can download it as a PNG with a transparent background. So it means that all of that space around my head will be cut out. So I can go in and use that wherever I might want to go in and have a, a, a non-backgrounded image. I can save it as a JPEG, I can save it as a PDF. It's automatically going to go in and save it as my project one or one slash one or one slash two or one slash three. And that's just saved that directly into my downloads folder. To get back to your home page from anywhere inside of Express, you just go up to the top left hand corner where you've got the little A icon, click on it, and it takes you back to your home page. You'll notice any of your recent projects, anything that you've been working on pops up at the bottom of the page there. And you can also find them all directly through your projects tab over here on the left.
you can create folders and that way you've got the ability to go in and organize and structure your work. So we're going to go in and create a web page now. I'm going to click on the little circle with a plus. I'm going to scroll down to web page. And when I click on web page, it's going to pop up with a screen that asks me for three bits of information. It asks me for a title, it asks me for a subtitle, and it asks me for a background photo. So for the title, I'd recommend you look at putting your name in. If you're doing this for an assessment, it might be the name of the assessment. The subtitle might be the name of the student or the student number or the project itself and you know, vice versa. It's, it's, it's up to you. The photo, we're going to go in and just pull in a background image. So I'm going to type in my name, which is Al Briggs. I'm going to type in my subtitle, which is uh, Education Consultant. And then you'll see again, wherever we've got that circle with a plus, that's where we go in and add in stuff. And so in this case, I'm going to go in and add in an image. For our background, because this is a web page, not a website, this is essentially working like that home banner. So I can go and make it a short cover, which is going to be like a little banner at the top. I can make it a split layout, which is half image, half text. Or I can just go in and have a full image in that background. So when I click on photo, you'll see I get my Adobe stock engine popping up here. I've also got the ability to go in and pull in images from other sources. So you don't have to use Adobe stock. But one of the great things about Express is that it does give you access to Adobe stock. Adobe stock is a list of over 200 million resources that you can go in and use across your projects. We don't have time in today's session to go and take a look at it, but talk to your institution about your licensing agreement and arrangement there in terms of what you have access to. Adobe Stock is a brilliant place to go in and grab images. And one of the other really fantastic things from an education perspective is that when you're going in and creating content in an Adobe Express web page, it will automatically credit the images that you have used directly from Adobe Stock. It's not doing it in a Harvard referencing format or, or Chicago referencing style or anything like that, but it does at the very least give you that base reference link so that students know and teachers know where the images are being sourced from. So if I click in there through Adobe Stock, like I said, my background is I, I, I'm a graphic designer by trade. So if I go in and type in graphic design, and hit enter, it's going to search through the Adobe Stock database and you'll see there's 1,725,001 results from Adobe Stock. I'm not going to go through those. I could go in and do a more specific search if I knew that I wanted to be looking at things that had colour books or typography or something. But let's just for now go in and pull an image that's got a bit of interest, that's sort of a nice wide space. Uh, let's find something that's a little bit interesting. Okay. We've got this sort of colourful thing that sort of sits and works quite nicely. You'll notice there's a little spinny wheel as it's going in and loading that image in. And then we get this nice little vignetted design that sits in the background with our text plonked on top. And we've now got a prompt at the bottom of the screen that says, scroll to start writing your story. What I've got here is a web page, a web page that is not complete, but I've got the bare bones in here. All I need to now do is add some content in. I can at any stage see what this looks like. And if you remember back at the top of the session, I shared that QR code and said, put this on your mobile, they look great on mobile. When you're working on a mobile phone, because you're dealing with a portrait uh, layout, which means it's, 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 it's narrower than it is tall, as opposed to landscape, which is your desktop, which is wider than it is tall, the way that the images work is slightly different. So when you're dealing with an image like this, it's going to resize on most desktops and you'll see you've got that nice sort of flow. Dimensionally, it's going to work really well. You might find though that when you're looking at it on a mobile phone, it's not cropping to the area that you want. By default, it's always gonna crop the image to the very middle of it. And so if we do that, we're just going to have the finger there. Now, I might decide that I think this bit of pencil is actually a little bit more interesting as, as a bit of image to be going and including there. So I'll give you a very quick tip on how you can go in and, and adjust that and see what it's going to look like on mobile while you're still on the desktop. So I'm going to click on this image and you'll notice when I click on the image, I get my contextual menu popping up. I can replace an image, I can delete it again because it's the background. I can go in and make it a short cover or a split layout. 
but I can also go in and change the focal point. And when I do that, I'll get a little prompt that pops up in the top right hand corner of my window. And it's going to show me what it looks like in that portrait or mobile preview. So watch what happens when I click on focal point. You'll see, there we go. We've got this weird sort of disembodied figure sitting in the middle of there. And you'll see on screen now, I've got a prompt that says drag to choose focal point. So I could potentially click and drag that so that it's going across. So we've got the pencil sitting there. I might want to just go in and have it so it's just the color patches and, 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 and not the, the finger at all. But you'll notice it's not really changing what's happening on my desktop. It's just changing what happens on portrait. So it just means you've got that extra control. So if you really do want to go in and have a very specific feel to your piece that is the same or different if you're looking at mobile versus versus um, browser based, you can do that really easily through that focal point option. So you just click on when you're happy with it, save at the top right hand corner and we're good to go. You do that with any image, but keep in mind that the images that you're using inside of a document will have uh, constraints in terms of how they're going to fit. So we're going to scroll to start writing our story. And when we do that, you'll see you get, again, little circle with a plus, so place we can add content. And this is the, this is the sacred seven. This is the seven lists that you can go in and add anywhere inside of your document. You can add photos and you can do all sorts of things with photos. And we're not going to spend time going in and going through all of the different options here because part of the wonderful thing about Express is when you explore and experiment for yourselves, you'll find new combinations and new ways to go in and make your work look amazing. But you can add photos, you can add text, you can add buttons, you can embed video from YouTube, Vimeo or Express. You can create photo grids, you can create glide shows, which, as I said before, that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. And a glide show is essentially like a PowerPoint slide with a with a text box that sits on top of it. And you can create a split layout, which is half image, half text. I'm going to go in and create that glide show. And when I do, by clicking on glide show, it gives me another prompt that says, add a few background photos to your glide show. Every image I add in is going to add in another slide into my presentation. So for now, I'm just going to go in and do one, but it's very easy to go in and add in multiple images just literally by clicking on them. You can change the order of them by moving them forward and backward. You can replace them. You can delete them really, really easily, really, really simply. So if I use this sort of user interface prototyping idea as my background image, if I'm happy with that, again, I can just go in and click on save. But again, you can notice at any stage I can bring in non-Adobe stock images if I want to or need to. When I click on save, it's going to take me back to my edit window and you'll see I've got a full page image with this semi-transparent text box, again with a little circle and a plus so we know we can add content in there. Inside of that, because we're setting this up as a, as a sort of an, an about me page or, or, or a brief introduction page, I'm going to put a little bit of text and I'm also going to put my headshot in. Now, this is where if you're doing this in a classroom context, you may be suggesting to your students that, you know, that, that they have a little bit of text prepared. For teachers, it might be going in and, you know, including contact details or their availability or when, where their office is, you know, all, all, all those sorts of bits and pieces. When I click on that little circle, though, this time, you'll notice I don't have the seven options. I've only got four. I can only add a photo. I can add text. I can add a button. I can add a video. So you can't go in and do a glide show inside of a glide show. It's not like Russian nesting dolls where you can have this infinitely regressing inception sort of style design. Just simple. Keep it simple. If I click on text, I get my rich content editor popping up and you'll see I've got quite limited options. So it's not like in Word where I can go in and choose my, 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 my typeface or it's not like in, in InDesign or Illustrator or Photoshop where I can go in and set my letting and set my type size and all of that sort of stuff. You're based on a theme. So H1 is your main heading, H2 is your subheading. The little quotation marks are obviously for a pull quote. You can go in and create a bulleted list, a numbered list. You can make your text bold, italic or hyperlinked, and you can change your alignment to left, center, or right. So when I go to H1, 
you'll notice my prompt changes and I'm just going to go in and do a very quick thing that is a sort of an about me page. So I'm going to type in about me. You'll notice as I'm typing that in, I've got a little circle with a plus both above and below that. So wherever I am inside of my document, I can always add additional content at any point. And you do that, like we've said before, just by clicking on the little circle. When I hit enter, you'll notice another one pops up and then I've then got my prompt coming through. By default, it will automatically go back to the body copy style or the regular text style. And I'm just going to go in and copy in some text that I've prepared earlier, just so that you don't have to watch me going in and try and come up with um, a descriptor for myself. I'm going to paste that in. And you'll see that's just four very brief paragraphs about myself that might be something that sit inside of a, a staff profile page on, on, on my website or inside of my learning management system. I can go in and I can adjust this at any stage. So if I wanted to go in and change that styling, again, if you want to see what a, what a, a subheading looks like, or you want to see what a quotation looks like. I've got all that ability to go in and format and I can turn that formatting on and off just by clicking on it. If your uh, rich content editor has disappeared, you just need to click into your text at any point to go in and get it back. By default, yours is going to look slightly different to mine because by default, you're going to have a base theme that has been applied. Up in the top right-hand corner, you'll see you've got this little themes option. That's my brand called Al. You won't have access to that brand because you're not Al. Maybe you're Al. If Al, if you're out there, hi. Nice to see you. Um, but you can create your own brand. You can have it look however you want. The default one that you're going to be using is one called Crisp. And Crisp is, Crisp is fantastic because it is as it says on the box. It is crisp. It is clean. It is very vanilla. Lots of negative space. Nice, clean, simple, sans serif typeface. None of the design elements get in the way of the message, which is a really useful thing. But there are a lot of other themes in there and you can explore through them. Like I said, if you want to go in and create your own or you want to encourage your students to go in and create their own, or if you've got needs because you're doing this for a client or for your university, you can go in and create that theme very easily by, it's a, literally a three-step process inside of your brands where you go in and you grab your logo, you grab a color and you grab a, a typeface and you can then go in and customize all the elements inside this layout. So crisp is what you're using. I'm going to go in and use my one, which is called light. And it's that easy to go in and apply that theme. Just literally click on and you'll see it's changing the appearance, not the content. So nothing there is changing. It's just the typefaces that are being used, the coloring, that sort of stuff is changing. Okay. So that's under themes. Feel free to go in and play as much as you want. I'm now going to go in and bring in that headshot that we we created earlier where we went in and, and removed the background. So to do that, I'll click on my plus, go to photo. And this time, rather than going in through Adobe Stock, because my image is not going to be in Adobe Stock, I'm going to upload it and I can choose wherever I want to go in and upload it from. So it might be on my desktop. It might be in my documents folder. It might be in my downloads. In this case, I know it's in my downloads and I can see it right there in my downloads. And you'll see, presto, it pops that image in. Now, again, I can replace, delete, do all those sorts of things. The other thing that you'll notice with images is that you get this little cog popping up in the bottom right-hand corner of the window. And when you've got this little cog popping up, you can go in and add in image alt text. So in terms of accessibility, this is a really important thing because when you're going in and you're trying to make education resources or assets available to as many students as possible, going in and doing things like having this image alternative text in there means that if people are using a screen reader because they've got visual impairment or they've got graphic restrictions on their computer where they're unable to go in and see an image clearly, this will give that additional support. It also means that if you're going in and putting any of your work through um, accessibility measures, for, for, for tests and things to go in and make sure that they are accessible, this will go in and, and, and assist in that process. If it's just a decorative image, which means it's just there for a bit of eye candy and there's no, no val value in terms of the actual content of it, you can just tick on that little box that says image is decorative. 
You'll notice at the bottom of the box too, I can go in and add in a caption. So if students do need to go in and resource this stuff or reference this stuff correctly, they can go in and do that. So that's my page. I haven't gone in and put in a button yet. And that's the last thing I want to do before I'm actually ready to go out and publish this thing. So again, I'm going to click on the little circle with a plus. And this time I'm going to go in and hit my button. And with a button, it's going to ask me for two things. It's going to ask me for what I want the button to say and then what I want the button to do. So if I want this to be, you know, check me out at LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn profile. I could then just inside of that www.example box, that second box, I could go in and type in the link to that to, to that web address, which would be you know, linkedin.com forward slash albrix9 or whatever it is. Um, if you wanted to be going in and linking out to an external website, so for a student, if they're going in and doing this for a folio, it might be going in and going out to their Behance account, or it might be going out, again, it might be going to a LinkedIn, it might be going to um, an online publishing space that they've got work. But it also could be set up as an email link. So if you want people to go in and email you, you can set it up, email me Monday to Friday, nine two five inside of that rather than just typing in your email address which won't do anything you can set it up as a mail to and the way to set it up as a mail to basically all that's going to do is create a button where when somebody clicks on it it will automatically open up their mail server with an email address to you and then they can go on and start typing that so to do that you need to type in mail to m-a-i-l-t-o no spaces and then a colon and then you put in the email address so if i go in and do this one which is my email address mail to colon and then my open dot counter email when i click on save that button will now be something that when i'm going in and accessing it i can go in and share with with anybody i want at any stage so really useful way to go in and very quickly set up a way to to, to communicate you don't have to go in and set up a mail link in there. You don't have to set up an external link. But for students, it's a really great way to go in and um, create a very simple singular asset. It also is a great way to go in and link one express page to another one because it's not, as we said, a website. It's not something where we've got multiple pages together. If you want to go in and put multiple pages together, you can sort of game the system a little bit by linking to other pages inside that one page. You could also go in and use something like Adobe Portfolio and embed these express pages inside a, a, an Adobe Portfolio. When you go in and publish it, and we're going to be taking a look at this in a couple of minutes, you will see that there are multiple ways that you can go in and share um, your designs out in, in the wide world. At the top of the screen, we've got a couple of options here. We've got a preview, which is always good to go in and do a check before we, we, we publish it out so we can see what it's going to look like. What you'll notice when you click on preview is that all of these edit points, all of these little circles will drop away. So the whole thing will sort of tighten up a little bit. I'll show you what that looks like when I go in and click on preview. You'll see it goes in and loads and everything is just a little bit tighter. You'll notice too, when I go from my home screen and I start scrolling down, can you notice, possibly you can, it's doing a very slight pan effect on this image. That movement is called the Ken Burns effect. You would have seen it on every photo slideshow sort of um, bit of software that, that, that has been around for the last 20 something years. Um, it just gives a slight hint of movement as you're going through and when you're going in and doing this as a presentation it's a really nice subtle transition it's not stuff zipping in from the side and bouncing and doing all that sort of wild or wonderful stuff it's subtle and it works really nicely when you're scrolling on your mobile phone the image will sit in the background and just gradually move a little bit to give that idea of movement as that text box scrolls up so it's a really nice way you, to get a preview as to what it's going to look like on screen. You'll notice that when I'm inside of my, my preview window, all of my edit points have disappeared. I can hit either the escape key or click on the X in the top right-hand corner to get out of that preview window and back into my edit window. 
and I can then go in and change. And so I might decide that, well, actually, I want to go in and have this text box that sits on side of my glide show in the center or over on the right hand side. And so I'm literally just clicking that and dragging that to the center. That's a little bit too big. Maybe I'll go and put myself over onto the right hand side. And so you can play around with these layouts. And if you're doing multiple glide shows together, changing that formatting or changing the positioning of that of that text element can just give a really nice um, little bit of personality to your design so that it's not just stock standard, everything always in the same place at the same point. Don't go too crazy with it because the whole point of it is, is, is that you're letting Adobe do the hard work in terms of the layout and you're focusing on the content. Like I said before, there's also some other options up the top here. And one of the wonderful ones that, that takes this from being a web page to being an amazing tool for research reports, for presentations, for, for lectures, for all sorts of things, is the present window. And when you click on present, it will take your computer full screen. You'll see you've got little contextual up and down arrows sitting at the bottom right hand corner there. If you've got a device like a, a, a little clicker like Probably going to be blurry but this sort of a thing it's definitely going to be blurry where you've got back and forth arrows or you know a laser pointer or something like that you can go in and you can use that to go between your slides you can also use your left and right arrow keys on your keyboard and it works like this i hit my right arrow it takes me to my next screen because the content that's inside that that text box doesn't fit entirely on a single screen it will fit what it can to start with and then scroll through to the next section and then as I keep going through, like I said before, any image that I've used from Adobe Stock automatically pops up in this credits. Because I've applied a brand, this has got my own little logo type that sits at the bottom there. And so that's where you could put your university or your school logo in there if you wanted to, or if you've got your own personal brand mark or something you want to go in and use, or if students have got their own, they can go in and do it. Again, I can either click on the little X in the top right-hand corner or hit escape on my keyboard to get back out of that. And that is a web page that I said 42 minutes ago would take us about 35 minutes, but I did ramble on a little bit at the start of the session. So we are running a little bit ahead of time. Um, we're ready to go. We're ready to publish and share this out into the world. And so under the share option, you'll see a couple of things. And I am going to go in and publish this, but I do also want to show you that you can go in and do a couple of other things. You can save a version of it to a Google Drive. It's not going to be something that you can then go in and open up inside of Google Drive that will redirect you back here, but it's sort of like a, a, an additional backup save point for you. You can invite, so you can have other people working on the file. You can have multiple people working on a file. At the moment, in Express, you can only have one person at a time inside of a web page. So it means if you're getting students doing group work, they can't all be in the file at the one point in time. You can go in and you can share that document out but only the person who created the document has publishing rights. And again, these things are in a little bit of flux. You will see if you're going in and playing around in the Adobe Express beta space, there are a lot of examples of documents where you can have multiple collaborators in there at once. But for now, web page is just a single publisher. So I can also go in and print it out. And so if you're submitting this through your learning management system and you need a digital asset for submission, for student records, for audit purposes, all that sort of stuff, you can actually click on print. And rather than going through your printer, you can change the destination to save as PDF, which is not necessarily gonna make it a beautiful immersive website, which is what we created. You'll see it does go in and make it quite static where it's got the image with the text on top of it, and then it's got our glide show image, and then it's got our text, and then it's got our image, and then it's got the rest of our text. So it's not as beautiful a layout, but it does have all of the content in there. The real advantage of having it as a PDF is that if your students need to submit and it needs to go through Turnitin, for example, for plagiarism checks, they can go in and submit that PDF and it will go through all of those checks. Just click on save to go in and save out that PDF. By default, it's calling it Adobe Express, which is not a great 
file naming process because if you call that first file Adobe Express, the next one you save will be called Adobe Express 1, and then Adobe Express 2, and then Adobe Express 3, and then you can't remember what any of your files are. So make sure that you're getting your students to go in and name their files appropriately. <coughs> Excuse me. We're now ready to go in and publish. So if we go under our share option, we want to go to publish and share link. And when we do that, we'll get a, a little dialog screen that pops up asking us for three bits of information. What do we want to call the document? Do we want to have author details turned on or off? And what do we want to do with the photo credits? So whatever you put into the title is what it's going to default to for the title. So I put in Al Briggs. That's what it's going in and, and calling it. All that means is that when I go in and open this up in a web browser, that's going to be the name that sits at the top tab on my web browser. It'll just say Al Briggs. So if I wanted it to be, if I know it's a CV or if I know it's an assignment or if I know that it's a, it's a presentation piece, I would go in and change that name. You can choose a category if you want, but there's no, no need to go in and choose a category if you don't, don't want to. So I'll just go in and call it, say, Reflective Journal. Like I said, the author details by default are turned off. Click on the slider to turn them on. They are editable text fields. The details tend to get pulled directly from your institution account. So if you have a preferred name that is different to what appears there, you can go in and change that. And it's just going to put a little publishing credit at the bottom of your page. You can even go in and include a headshot or an icon inside of that little box if you wanted to. You'll see the photo credits is a completely editable text field. It's not, like I said before, going in and doing proper Harvard referencing. It's not referencing the fact that I used my own headshot. It's only pulling in details for those images that I grabbed directly out of Adobe stock. So I could go in and change that. I could reformat it if I wanted to. If I did the worst possible thing, which is delete it all and realize that I need to bring it back, I could just get outside of that photo credits box, click on restore and bring it back. But when I'm done with those three things, I've got my title, I've got my author details sorted out, and I've got my photo credits, I can click on create link at the bottom there. And when I do that, I'll get a little dialogue box that pops up. There'll be a, a design tip or maybe an inspirational design quote that sits in there. You'll see the little blue progress bar sits at the top. Generally takes about 10 to 15 seconds. And then we're good to go. That shareable link is your published web page. So you'll notice it's not adobe.com forward slash Albriggs web page. It is express.adobe.com forward slash page. And then there's an alphanumeric sequence that follows on. This is a this is a, a public link. So anybody who has access to this link can see this content. However, they're not going to be able to go in and do a Google search for Albriggs web page and have this page come up. If you want to get back into the publish options to go in and change anything, you can just click on the publish options, get back in there. I would always recommend that you look at copying that link out because that link is not going to change as long as that page is published. You can share it with Mark Zuckerberg. You can share it with Elon Musk. You can share it with Microsoft Classroom. Uh, sorry, with Google Classroom, with Microsoft Teams. You can email it directly out to teachers, students, colleagues, whomever. And you can grab embed code, like I said. It's a really great thing to go in and look at embedding it. You can embed these pages inside of your learning management system. It's something I do all the time. It's a really fantastic way to go in and, and get some, some interest going on inside of your learning management system. But these pages are absolutely brilliant because they're very easy to edit. They're very easy to access. You don't need access to specific software to be able to go in and create them. I'm going to copy that code out, and this is what I always do at the end of a session. So once I've copied that, I'm going to go back into my, my Express homepage. I'm going to very quickly go back into my little circle with a plus, go to generate QR code, and I'm going to paste that URL that I just created and click on create QR code. That's going to go in and create a QR code that I can then go in and share. So if you're using this for your notes, if you're using this for your weekly notes for students or your to-do lists or you know whatever it is, you can really easily go in and create that QR code, send it out so that you can share that object with the students right at the end of the lecture. And then they don't have the excuse of, oh, I can't access the learning management system. Oh, I forgot my email password, et cetera, et cetera. This is a, this is a live link. They can go in and have that asset with you ready to go. You can do it for shopping lists. 
you know, creating QR codes is a very, very useful thing. It's one of the things that I'm really grateful for um, from COVID is bringing QR codes back into our lives. I love a QR code. Big fan, huge fan. You can customize it. You can change the color of it. You can make it blue or orange or red or green. You can make it circles if you want. I'm a traditionalist. I like my black and white squares. But you can see there too, you can go in and change the file type. So if you want to go in and have it as a vector file, you can make it an SVG. So you can scale it up to be huge. You can go in and make it a JPEG or you can make it as a PNG. When you click on download, it's literally just going to go in and download it directly into your downloads folder. So that's the final step. And like I said, that's a really nice way to go in and share that resource. It also means that if your students are going in and doing a presentation to their fellow students, they can share their work really easily using these QR codes. But Al, I have questions. What if I want to go in and edit it? Is it automatically going to republish any change that I go in and make? So I've decided after creating this that I don't want the text over on the right. I want it over on the left. That's fine. I can move it over on the left. You'll notice that as I'm moving these elements around, as I'm going in and changing any element, just up the top there where it says web page, there's a little dialog window that pops up saying saving. That is saving it. It is not republishing it. So I can go in and I can publish a web page, have it sit online, come back into Express, make any changes that I want to, but until I go in and re-update that or reshare it, it's not going to publish those changes. Yeah. So you've got that level of security there where it's not publishing every new change that you make live. To go in and make those changes live, you just go under your share option up there at the top, go back into publish and share link. And this time you'll get a little lightning bolt that says, hey, you made some changes. Do you want to update the link? It's not going to change the link. That link, that shareable link is static. That is going to stay with the page for the life of the page. But when you update it, it's just going to update what has been published. And so once I do that, same process, 10, 15 seconds maybe. If you've got embedded videos, it might take 10, 20 seconds longer. But as a general rule, it's not taking a super huge amount of time when it's going in and doing this. Copy that link out just to go in and make sure. And I'm now going to be good to go. So if I go into my browser, I can bring in a new tab and paste that in. And presto, here's my web page for the very first time. Very, very cool. Now I can go back into my projects. So if I'm back inside of my Express window, I can go back into projects. And I do have the ability to take a look there. I can see how many times it's been viewed. I know it's only been viewed once because I'm the person who viewed it and I looked at it online and so therefore I can see there's one view there. I've got options in here. I can go in and I can move it to another location so I could drag it directly into another folder. I can invite people directly through there. I've also got my triple dots. Through here I can go in and share. I can go directly into my publish. I can duplicate it and this is another really useful thing. So if you're going in and you're setting up a lecture series or you're setting up um, basically templates that you want to go in and reuse for different aspects of a project or for a client, going in and setting up a default layout sort of style and then duplicating it saves you so much time rather than trying to start from scratch every time and bringing that sort of content in. You can say I can rename it, I can delete it and I can also unpublish it. So if I decide, you know, if I do have lecture notes, for example, and I want to pull them down at the end of each semester, I can do that by just clicking on unpublish. So if I scroll down to unpublish, it's just going to pull it offline. And we're good to go. So that's Adobe Express web pages in a nutshell. We've got about five minutes left of the session. And so I just want to quickly show you some of the things that that, that are, are coming very shortly. And when I say very shortly, I've been told by reliable sources inside of Adobe that we're talking about quarter four. So it'll be towards the end of the year that these new features are going to be incorporated in. Express is in public beta. Like I said before, you can access that directly through your Adobe Express window at the top there. Some people will be directed directly to it. It's also just new.express.adobe.com if you want to type it in. And what you'll see there is that you've got very similar 
um, interface in terms of the circle in the, in the top left-hand corner. You've got all of your templates that sit along there, but you've also got this folder that is really helpfully named Your Stuff. And inside of Your Stuff, you can go in and find all of your files. So files that you've created, um, brands that you've created, libraries. There's some brilliant stuff for education that are really education focused inside of beta like i said before the the online collaborative ability going in and having multiple people inside of a file at the one time is a wonderful thing from an education context when you're getting students to go in and mind map or storyboard or play around with ideas do that teamwork planning stuff it's a really brilliant easy way to go in and capture that information you'll see there are thousands more templates in here now when i click over here on the left you can see I've got all of these different sizes for options. I've got all of these different, I can go in and create coupons. I can go in and create Etsy and Facebook bits and pieces. I can do mind mapping. I can go in and do, if I really want, I can create a rubric or a report card. And you can use all sorts of templates to assist with this process. So really, really useful. But the fun bit that everybody likes to have a play with, and I do recommend that you have a play with it because it is fun is the generative AI. And generative AI is the machine learning. There's a lot of talk about generative AI and chat GPT and things inside of education. This is the fun aspect of it. This is the bit where you can get a bit creative. And so what this is doing is rather than going in and harnessing all sorts of copyrighted images by artists, designers, photographers worldwide, it is only utilizing images through Adobe Stock. So every image you know is trusted and is something that can be accessed through here. Um, we've had some great fun with some of our students going in and generating up some of these images. So here's one we prepared earlier. This is with a group of students um, doing, um, I think it was certificate for tertiary preparation. Um, and our prompts for this were cow, leather, and red. And it went in and produced a cow wearing a red leather jacket, which is, I don't know, slightly weird and cannibalistic, but beautiful image, right? So you can go in and you can really easily go in and create these things just by clicking on generative AI, describing some things. So um, I've got two dogs at home with me at the moment. So I've got a Cavoodle and I've got a King Charles Cavalier Spaniel. I'm going to say Cavoodle. I'm going to say um, uh, that he is made of paper um, and he is blue. None of which are true, but we'll see. The great thing about this is it, it's like rolling a dice. You're not quite sure what you're going to get. You know that you're going to get something. All right. And that's absolutely rubbish. It's, it's given me absolutely nothing. Um Obviously, Cavoodle was, was, was too specific. Maybe if I put in puppy. Let's see what we get here. But you'll see there, there you go. There's my little blue puppy made out of paper. And these are images that you can go in and like, you can use, you can adjust. I mean, they're kind of, they're kind of gorgeous. And you'll notice too with them, they've got these little prompts where it's got a, a thumbs down, a thumbs up or a flag. So if you like the image, if you think it's done a good job, you can click on the little thumb up and say what worked really well. And if you don't like it, if you don't think it was appropriate, you can click on the thumb down. Because it's machine learning, you're actually helping to train in the same way that you train a puppy, you're helping to train the engine to produce images that are going to be really useful for you. And so you can then go in and do all those sorts of things with those images, where you can go in and download them as PNG or as JPEG or as PDFs. So you can go in and use them in all sorts of locations. You can change the, the style of them. So you can go in and give them a, a certain feel. So if you like Synthwave, which is that sort of, you know, that fluorescent um, sort of pop punk electro sort of vibe, you could go in and create that. And again, Sometimes you get really horrible results. Sometimes you get magnificent results. Um, have a play with this stuff. It is really, really fun. When you're in beta, like I said before, same deal. It's just the little circle with a plus to go in and create content. If you are playing around and jumping in between Express and beta, at the moment, they're not talking to each other because beta is all of the testing stuff. So if you're creating stuff, it's the same login but do be aware that you'd need to be in the different spaces to be able to go in and access the files, unless you're going in and downloading them, of course. 
So that's it. We've sort of gone almost exactly to time. Thank you very, very much for your time um, today. As I said, I've shared that that link to the um, the presentation. Please grab your phone out, grab that if you need it. Refer to it at any stage. There are all sorts of tips and tricks in there and, and the links out. And there is also, very importantly, a link out to all of the Adobe team. So if you do have questions about anything to do with um, driving engagement at your institute, please reach out to Adobe's education team. They are wonderful people. Um, they can give you all of the assistance. They can run workshops for you. They can go in and make sure that you and your students are best equipped to absolutely nail anything that you possibly want. If you are interested as an educator on continuing on this journey, you can go in and look at enrolling into something like the Adobe Creative Educator Program, which essentially goes through what we've gone through today, where you're going in and building up some assets that you can go in and use in a classroom context. Thank you very much for your time. I am very, very appreciative of the time that Adobe has given me to share with you through these, these um, presentations these last few weeks. Please feel free to reach out if you do have any questions at any stage, but happy creating and all the best. Thank you.